Got him, Mr. Speaker. I call Ron Mark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, it's a very short bill, and uh, as is that often the pattern when you get a bill this size going through the House and everybody's uh, in agreement that the, the bill should proceed, as the challenge really is, Mr Speaker, is trying to find something that hasn't been said already. Um, I got, I've got to say again, and I, I sat up in my, my office, uh, watched a bit of the, uh, the House on the telly, and I'm going to say it again, and some people might th start to think this is a bit monotonous, Mr Speaker, but... The difference between the way in which this select committee operates and the way in which I'm witnessing some of the other select committees operate and their consequential reports back into the House is really quite astonishing. It really is quite astonishing. And, and I've got to say to the front bench members of the National Party, watch out, because there's some people working in your caucus and the back benches and chairing and deputy chairing select committees who've got all the talent and all the skills to take the place of people like Nick Smith, who quite clearly, looking at this legislation, how it got to be here, can't do his damn job properly continues to fall over. I mean, why are we here? Why have we spent this fortune? The way in which this, this legislation has been managed through the committee, and I take my hat off to the National Party team, because at one stage the bill was set to provide a six-month transition period, and um, I just think through some sensible discussion and some cooperative dialogue with the select committee came down and unanimously agreed that nine months was a more sensible place and a, and a nice compromise to, to be at. Some wanted 12 months, some wanted six, you know, it started out at six months. But so the bill has arrived here at the report back uh, with a nine month clause in there, which we'll, we'll deal with in the committee stage as we go through, Mr Speaker. But the, the tone, the flavour, the way in which this select committee operates, I think, is a credit to the House, it's a credit to the members who sit on it, it's a credit to the chair and the deputy chair, and to the opposition parties who sit at that table as well. So speaking of the bill, New Zealand First will support the legislation. I have to say, how bad do you have to be when you're a corporation as big as Shell Todd to get this wrong? Now, the only reason this legislation is here, quite frankly, as far as I can see, is that they got it wrong, they mucked up, they went running and screaming to the government. The government, they said, look, you need to jump. The government said, how high? And they said, high enough to change the legislation. And so here we are. And many, many months later, we've got the bill going through the House and we're taking, carefully scraping the egg off their, off their faces. But I have to contrast this when I look at what's happening up in Auckland and how far, and, and how Ngāti Whātua have been treated on the first right of refusal. It seems on one hand, if you're big enough, bold enough, and you're worth billions of dollars, you can come and the government will turn, spin on a sixpence. But if, you're, uh, if you've negotiated for 12 years on a treaty settlement and you've got a first right of refusal in there, suddenly it doesn't exist. I look at this legislation here and I think how easy it is to actually put uh, into place something sensible that is fair to all parties. I mean, the government could have chosen to do nothing here. And how embarrassing would that have been? How detrimental would it have been to the company's operations and how detrimental would it have been to the jobs and the lives of those people employed? The sensible, uh, sensible solution was to go through and change the legislation. Um, so quite clearly the legislation, if I was to be terribly boring and read parts of it, uh, seeks to amend section 162 of the exclusive economic zone, continental shelf environment effects uh, Act 2012, uh, the clause has been adjusted a very simple, it allows them to continue operating following the expiry of the um, permit uh, privileges operators may have received on the marine consent. It actually gives them time to get that, uh, it specifies a time by which they must lodge their consents and get them cleared through. It's not an open checkbook, uh, they don't actually, looking through, they don't get to continue to operate the bill will allow operators to continue mining while their consent application is in progress and any appeals determined. The purpose of the bill is to provide greater certainty of petroleum mining companies operating in the exclusive zone and to help their transition to the 2012 regulations. And that's all sensible stuff. So there's really not a lot more I can say in that. The mining with the marine consent, those clauses New Zealand First agrees with. We uh, are quite, I guess, Quite easy in the fact, Mr Speaker, that um, this is a sensible change. Um, I guess my colleague Fletcher Tabato spoke in the first reading. Uh, I think he did have a few terse words for the Minister and he, he did make it clear to the government that uh, he felt it's, we, we felt then that this is a bit of a stuff up, but, uh, and quite clearly it has been. And from where I sit now, having sat on the select committee, I can see the people who did uh, who did get it wrong with Todd. 
I think um, hopefully that's a lesson to be learnt by them. Hopefully anyone else out there, and I did make the point in select committee, uh, now understands the need for them to be planning ahead. I would have thought a company that big would do those things naturally, but clearly not. I did draw in the select committee phase the a parallel to councils. I mean, tiny little old Carterton council, I guess Todd would buy and sell Carterton you know, 100 times over. Um, we have issues around resource consents and compliance with that. And we had to ensure that when our consents were about to expire, that we got the applications in on time and that those consents did, A, at best case, did not expire, but at, at worst case, they were, in trend, they were in progress at the time they did and we got the extensions to them uh, when, such a, when such occasions rose. But generally speaking, local government throughout New Zealand deals with this sort of matter all the time, Mr Speaker. And if they're not on top of their game for their water takes, for their water discharges, then things get messy. I just don't, for the life of me, understand how a multi-billion dollar organisation like this can get things so badly wrong and require us to be sitting in the House passing legislation. Mr Speaker, I'll just conclude by saying um, congratulations to the team. It's a great team to work on in the Local Government Environment Select Committee. Enjoying the work there. It's a small bill. I don't think there's much more to be said, but I guess we'll have to say it all again during the committee stage. Kia ora. Uh, the um, next call is a split call. I call Eugenie. So